And how's it going, everyone? And welcome to No Fun Allowed. Today, you are joined by an incredibly special guest. Today here, we have the author of Joy of Extra Dimensional Spaces, Michael. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Good day. Yeah, um, I'm Mike Polkinghorn. And uh, as we were saying when we were talking earlier, I'm probably the most famous person you've never heard of. Um, <laughs> I'm the uh, Dungeon Master producer and writer for the Relic of the Past podcast. And uh, I think that's what caught Wizard's Eye and uh, got me on the list of authors for the Candlekeep Mysteries and ended up doing the uh, level one adventure, The Joy of Extra Dimensional Spaces. Yeah, I mean, and uh, not to toot your horn, horn too much or to me to your horn. That is honestly one of my most favorite ones because for level one, you have to be careful because you want to do something cool, but at the same time, it can't be deadly. But I no. truly think that Joy of Extra Dimensional Spaces hits that sweet spot of it's fantastical, it's awesome, but at the same time, it's not going to be a uh, you know, meat grinder. <laughs> it yeah, is, well, it, it can be a little bit. I don't know if you've listened to some of the uh, playthroughs, but there's I, been a couple of folks that have had... I, yeah, it really struggles. comes down to, uh, you know, I think it really comes down to how many people are willing to touch that chair in the corner. I think that's kind of a big one. Yes. <laughs> But, or touch um, anything, yeah. It was a hilarious playthrough that I listened to where they had a barbarian that just had to touch everything. <laughs> and it's like, no, you don't want to do that in this mansion. That's very bad in this mansion. <laughs> Towards the end of the adventure, the rest of the players like, oh, I'm not helping him this time. <laughs> How'd you learn your lesson the first couple of times? Yeah, yeah, I, I've covered the thing, I've ran the thing, and I'm, I'm in the whole community about, uh, about all of the Candle Key Mysteries, and of course we get some wacky, zany, oh yeah, someone got choked out by one of the, the hands, and oh, someone got, you know, someone tried running away and, uh, you know, got themselves killed or whatever. So we definitely get those stories a lot, but I think if you have a more tempered group, then it should be okay-ish, <laughs> it should be. Yep, uh, my uh, podcast crew actually went through and, and, and did it. We put it up there as one of our podcast episodes. And there was a little, ep um, you know, a bit of YOLO in there. <laughs> <laughs> and they did end up touching just about everything uh, just because of that. Uh, so yeah, there was a bunch of times we're like, you sure you want to do that? Really? <laughs> okay. Yeah, when the DM has to bust out the line of, do yeah. you really want to do that? <laughs> Maybe start thinking otherwise. So what was the design philosophy behind it, right? So you sit down and you are flagged with running a low level adventure. How do you actually sit there and say to yourself, okay, this is it. This is the adventure I'm gonna run. Well, there was a whole lot of back and forth that went on. Um, uh, as you've probably seen from some of the other folks, uh, we all got an invitation uh, through email or other messaging and uh, were, um, all given the option to pitch an adventure for this upcoming book that was going to be put out. And uh, so of course, you know, I'm like, yeah, sign me up. This would be great. Well, actually, no, I should step up. When I first got the email in, I, I first took a look at it and went, this has got to be the worst phishing email ever. Every uh, like, single author has said that. A, Every single one. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then I'm like looking through, it's like, oh no, the guy actually works at Wizards. How about that? And uh, so uh, then, you know, once we opted in, we got uh, the the details on what was going on. And so we were given the uh, instruction to pitch an adventure and we were given a level range. I was given levels one to four and I was just like, well, if you've got levels one to four, I mean, you got to do level one. I mean, grand level three is kind of where everyone gets all the really cool stuff and they really start getting into their, into their classes. But just the magic of, of level one where you're going in and you've got nothing and you don't know anything. And, and uh, so I, I decided to, to go for that. Um, and then we started hitting the bumps in the road. Uh, the the uh, first really big bump was the fact that uh, I started playing in 1979. <laughs> so I'm a Greyhawk kid. And all of a sudden it's like, well, it's set in the realms because the realms is what we're doing. It's like, yeah, didn't Ed Greenwood put that together? I had a bone <laughs> up on that. So I went and had to go and go back in my library of uh, especially second edition stuff and pull out the books. And it's like, okay, yeah, I, I remember uh, running this way back in the day. And, you know, had to bone up on that and candle keep what's candle keep It's a library. I know it's a library and had to go and get any and all data I could on it. Th thank goodness we have the internet now because there's <laughs> a whole lot of whole lot of repositories out there of info there. And um, so then I started brainstorming on what I would do with this. And I had just the month before had uh, gone and gone through a uh, escape room over in the, the next town over. And I'm like, how about an escape type scenario? That would be kind of unique, um, especially, you know, 
if you think about a, a bunch of the old classic modules like uh, X2 uh, Caster de Amberville, mm -hmm. um, that was just basically one gigantic escape room, you know, with uh, magical things in it. So I started uh, churning through those ideas and I put my pitch together for an escape room type thing where you go in and you get sucked into one of the books and you have to then work your way out. And they uh, accepted that pitch. So I started working in on that. And so about three months later, we had to get our first initial draft in. So I, you know, I had the map, I had the, the, uh, all the, the rooms all laid out, uh, put it in there, and they hated it. <laughs> okay. That might be a little hyperbolic. It's not that they had, they had one idea what I was doing. I had my own idea what I was doing. Okay. So uh, Chris Perkins and I ended up basically sitting down and, and kind of doing a whole lot of back and forth. And Chris did a great job of kind of reining in my crazy ideas because uh, one of my initial ideas was that uh, you would uh, go basically to this extra-dimensional island. And this, the, uh, this thing was on an island. And then Chris pointed out that that would require an entirely new non-canon ninth level spell, and, which of course to me was like, yeah, so what's the problem with that? And, and <laughs> Make and, it legal, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and then, then I kind of stepped back and took a look at it from his perspective. And it's like, yeah, we probably don't want to invent a ninth level spell just to make my first level adventure work. So um, we, Chris and I did a whole lot of back and forth. And, and if you ever get a chance to work with Chris, he's just fabulous. Um, I don't know if it's just that he's Canadian, but you know how they say that a, a true diplomat is someone that can tell you to go to hell straight to your face and you'll thank them? Well, that's Chris. I mean, he, uh, he, would, he would just basically, this is all crap. And you're like, thank you, Chris. You're right. This is all crap. <laughs> I I clearly, he, not quite like that, but he, he, um, he, in his interview on this said, you know, he provided very direct feedback, but very constructive. And, and that was true. I mean, he, he pulled no punches, but it was all constructive feedback on, on the, uh, the process there. And so we, yeah, like, we went back and forth and we kind of narrowed it down to, um, well, you know, this island won't work, but we could make it a Morton Canaan's mansion. And then the, uh, the whole process took off from there. And so I went back to the drawing board and rewrote the whole thing as uh, Morton Canaan's mansion. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. It's what came out in the final form there. That's awesome to hear, you know, that, that design philosophy and the bouncing back and forth with one of the greats and the whole D&D scape and all that, you know, that sounds like a dream, right? I, you know, as mentioned before, you know, it sounds like everybody's like, oh, there's no way this is too good to be true. But then, you know, it actually happens. But then there it is, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was also kind of funny. I remember one night I, I came home and, and my older son needed um, some help with something he was doing. And I said, well, yeah, I can help you. But first I got to, um, you know, fire off an email to Chris Perkins. And he's like, okay, dad. <laughs> and by the way, that's really cool. <laughs> I was like, isn't it though? That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish I, I wish I could say that, right? And um, when, when that first started, when the whole creation was going on there, were you given a word count? Were you given a, it has to take place in this region? Or was it just a straight up, do whatever you want, but just submit it and make sure it's good? Um, there was a little bit of do whatever you want, but also it had some pretty uh, solid bumpers on either side. Uh, we did have an 8,000 word count and... Um, uh, the, the, first, the first draft I did really pushed that, but then when I had to rewrite it all, um, one of the nice things about the Morton Canaan's mansion is that it's only 50 squares. Mm -hmm. So I, I redid the map about two or three times till I got the final map. And that gave me the number of rooms and that gave me the number of, of, uh, of descriptions and all that. And by the time I got done, it, it very comfortably fit into that. Um, certainly if I'd had the island and all that, it, you know, probably would have run over, but uh, <laughs> they worked there. Um, but yeah, there, we had the strictures that, you know, it had to start with a, had to be a mystery and had to start with a book um, that you find in Candlekeep. And uh, then, you know, the, actually the first idea I had when I got that in was like, well, the treasure map will come floating out and, and you'll find it. And then uh, I looked at uh, the Book of the Raven, which was the example adventure that was given to us to pattern our adventures after, at least format wise. And uh, it's like, oh, well, it starts with a treasure map. Well, I guess I'll just uh, just give up on that idea. And then, uh, you know, got to the final idea that I did have. Um, and then, like I said, we, we had to put in a rough draft. There was a whole lot of feedback on the rough draft. And then um, we had uh, to turn around the final draft and get that in. Hey, I mean, it's good to hear that, you know, there's that much back and forth, right? The you know, you have to rein in some creative liberties. You can't go mm -hmm. completely off the rails unless you want to go inventing ninth level spells, apparently. <laughs> yes. 
And, you know, I, I feel like that would have eaten into your word count anyways, right? <laughs> so somewhere in there, yeah. And then, um, you know, the word count also included, it would have included any spells that you created, any uh, magic items, and any uh, creatures that you created. And I did end up adding uh, three new monsters to the list. Although one of them, the animated broom, was actually just a repeat from Curse of Strahd. Mm -hmm. And I'd forgotten it was in Curse of Strahd. So I'm, I'm going through the monster manual going, I know the broom's in here. <laughs> and the, so finally it's like, t you know, type that into the internet. It's like, oh, it was a Curse of Strahd, okay. And then I'm like, oh, I'm only allowed, that was another stricture. You're only allowed the three basic books. So monster manual, the Dungeon Master's Guide and the Player's Handbook. Ah, interesting, so it's like, okay okay, well, if I'm bringing something from Chris Scrod, I'm going to have to take the stat block and put it in whole cloth. So uh, I actually ended up putting that in there. So, Okay, yeah, that, that's very interesting to hear that they're, they're telling you, okay, you can't go, you can't make them buy, you know, <laughs> the 17th or 20th book, right? You know, <laughs> you, have to, you have to keep it in family, as it were. You got to keep it small. And uh, were you looking at other outside influences during your design philosophy or did, was it just that whole, I went to that escape room and now I'm going to create a D&D &D escape room? Well, um, a lot of the stuff uh, was informed by the stuff that I had done in the past. There's a lot of the original modules, like uh, like I said, X2, uh, Castle Amber, was Classic. basically one giant escape mansion. Um, and a lot of the the fun ones and, and uh, the, the uh, escape uh, scenario that was in the uh, Dungeons of the Slave Lords. Mm. Uh, but you know those those classic modules it's like those those were an awful lot of fun to do so I, I took a lot of inspiration from from those old classic ones as well that, that's awesome you know i i love old school stuff and we're seeing a huge comeback with the osr and it's awesome to hear that we're getting a little splashes of it here and there in the modern game we're especially seeing that of course with the uh with the two anthology books previous to this one we had uh the tales from the Unknown portal and ghost of saw march which were old school stuff and it, it, not only you, but also it, it painful, not painfully obvious, but clearly obvious that some of the other content creators uh, were taking some inspiration from old school stuff too. And that's totally yeah, awesome definitely. To see. That was great to see the awning portal come out and, and uh, you're like, wow, these are all the old ones I loved way back when. And then uh, same with Salt Marsh, where uh, actually when my kids got into Dungeons and Dragons um, and uh, that's kind of the whole fun Dungeons and Dragons adventure for me. Um, I started out with AD&D and, and the basic set way back in 1979 and played all the way through second, got a little bit into third, but then I was in college and I was working on my senior thesis and I graduated college and uh, went off into the horrible world of work. Um, <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> and I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was working for a little startup company that was working six days a week, et cetera. And uh, so I didn't have any time for anything. I mean, literally I, I got up, went to the office, came home, went to bed, did the same thing, rinse, repeat, I had like a day off. Yeah, it was, it was pretty bad, but you were right out of college, you kind of do those things. So I kind of dropped out of the Dungeons and Dragons world at that point in time. Um, and then when my kids got old enough, my, my older son just said to me one day, hey dad, you know anything about this Dungeons and Dragons thing? And I'm like, well, actually, yes I do. <laughs> and uh, I unfortunately lost all my collection Jeez. of uh, books in a garage fire. I had them all out in the garage and something caught in the garage and, and the whole thing went up. Uh, and then, you know, I had like all, you know, sets of the original Grenadier miniatures. I had the uh, wow. deities and demigods, the first, very first edition with all the uh, uh, mythos that they got sued for putting oh, in. Yeah, that's, and, oh, that's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those things are like $150 a piece now if you want to find them on eBay. Mm -hmm. And uh, had all those things, they all, and then, you know, all went up the smoke. So we went out and, and bought the fourth edition books. And I, I did like what most longtime uh Dungeons and Dragons players did when they cracked open the fourth edition books. They went, what the heck is this? <laughs> and, you know, paging through was like, this doesn't look anything like Dungeons and Dragons. But we played through it. We had a good time. Um, and then when we uh, announced D the D&D &D Next project, of course, we had to jump in on that. So we could uh, go and try to steer the next version of Dungeons and Dragons. And so we got a, a group of uh, people together, actually two groups of people together, and we were doing the play test with uh, with D and D Next all the way to the very end. And uh, when fifth edition came out, uh, we kind of jumped in, and and then a couple of our friends that were you know we we're talking about starting a campaign, and and uh, we were also at the same time we were bemoaning the fact that uh, we didn't have any clean Dungeons and Dragons podcast to play for the Boy Scouts, because I'm also a Scoutmaster, on the Boy Scouts on the way, you know, driving to and from the events. And so one of our guys said, why don't we just podcast ours? 
And we're like, okay, that sounds easy. <laughs> and uh, obviously it wasn't, but uh, the, the rest there is history as well. Just uh, got, got the podcast going. And, and then I think that's what caught uh, the eye of the folks over at Wizards. Yeah, I mean, so going on to your podcast there, you know, you say, you know, these humble beginnings of, oh, hey, let's just do it ourselves. And then flash forward years down the line, you're on episode 208. <laughs> Yeah, um, so. I thought we'd be done with this campaign in about two years, and we're only like about two thirds done, and we're at three years now. And uh, it was a huge, huge learning uh, process because uh, you know we started out, we had a couple of webcams for uh, for microphones and uh, just you know no software or anything to, to speak of, and no no real knowledge and. Uh, just kind of did everything wrong to begin with, but somehow kind of <laughs> muddled through. Um, when we finally got to the one-year mark, we're like, you know, the one thing holding us back is all this recording equipment. So uh, we uh, kind of dove in and actually got an, an honest-to-goodness uh, recording studio together and uh, have been uh, working with that ever since. Yeah, so once again, you know, these humble beginnings transform into something absolutely amazing. So you know, during this whole transitioning phase of starting off with nothing and then going from 2-8, uh, you know, whole episodes, do you think that your campaign is going exactly as it should? Or do you think that, like, you, you need to just keep on just throwing crazy, wacky shenanigans in there? Or Well, we do that anyways. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just because. But actually, I've, I've been really lucky as a dungeon master for the campaign on a couple of fronts. One, um, I've just been really lucky because I've just ended up with, just by chance, um, just really talented people that I'm playing with. Um, they were all scout leaders or family of scout leaders and things like that. Like I said, in the original Boy Scout troop. And, uh, you know, their sons have all gone on to, uh, to uh, bigger and better things, you know, have either eagled out or aged out of the program. And, but the, the adults are still hanging around. And it turns out that, you know, the uh, group that I got together is, is just uh, kind of fantastic on the microphone. Uh, but then the other way I've been really lucky is that uh, they all bought into wanting to know what the end of the story was. Um, so I don't, I don't have to railroad over the story because they're already on the rails going, what's the next stop? What's the next stop? What's the next stop? And so they, they kind of all bought into the, the storyline at the very beginning. And uh, they also influenced the storyline at the very beginning. Uh, it's been kind of fun. Like, for instance, uh, Drew plays Kraval, the dragonborn barbarian. And I hadn't decided to put dragonborn into my campaign. And it's like, you know, here's my character. He's a dragonborn barbarian. It's like, <laughs> Okay, well, okay, now we'll have to add Dragonborn. But then that, or, you know, added this entire storyline where there are now uh, a barbarian colony up in the mountains that a thousand years ago raided the lowlands, was beaten back, and has never been seen since, except as the boogeyman in, in late night stories. Except this one that just appeared. Why did he appear? And so we had this whole storyline on what happened there, plus then that opened up the. Uh, the Dragonborn up in the mountains, and we've had a whole series of adventures up there as well. And uh, that's awesome when you can get yeah. a group of players that actually help, you know, with the world building and help shape the future of the campaign. And yeah, uh, well, as you just mentioned, people that actually want to strive for, you know, mm -hmm, awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I actually let them kind of uh, have some pivotal parts in shaping the campaign. I drew up the map and then I, you know, put the cities and stuff on the map. And then I asked the characters for, or the players for their character backstories. And from that, that basically informed a whole lot of what was on that map, what was in those cities. Uh, like the city of Porto Magnum, I just had put it down that it was a tiered city of tiered walls going up the, up the hill. And, you know, started out with a keep at the top of the hill and they built another wall and another wall and another wall. So it's almost kind of like Minas Tirith and in, in Lord of the Rings. And, um, then uh, my older son, he uh, said, okay, well, my, uh, my uh, character is going to be a uh, dispossessed noble that has left the city and become a paladin to uh, go serve the light and, and uh, heal the sick and get away from all the, the rich people in, in the, this big city. And I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. So the tiers now are, the tier, are not just physical barriers, military barriers, but they're also economic barriers. So the, the really rich people live at the top where all the big estates are, and then the poor people live at the bottom. And 
it all flows downhill, literally. <laughs> um, as, as the characters came into Port of Magnum the first time, it, there was a, a, a coursing rainstorm going on and all of the sewers would back up down in the lower city because they were now channeling all of the, uh, the, the rain, rainwater from the all other uh, levels of the city. Um, and, but, you know, so he just kind of got the imagination going and we created this whole new city, uh, which was just a dot on the map before. That's, you know, that's, that's what everybody wants. Everyone wants that player. <laughs> everybody wants yeah. that kind of game. Like that, that sounds amazing. And you know, you, you are running these games, you are recording these games, you're showing off these games. Are you successful in your mission to convert people to playing D and D or these tabletop RPGs? Um, actually, uh, we we definitely were that. In fact, actually, the the Boy Scouts came up with a game we call Dungeons and Dysentery. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of this freeform diceless RPG that they made up on the fly, and it always seemed like at the very end someone drank a bottle of bleach and died. So, <laughs> so we, that's why we called it Dungeons and Dysentery. So it was pretty hilarious. But yeah, they they would create whole different you know, made up RPGs out on the outings, uh, plus a bunch of other ones. We, we had a, a, like a backpacking outing and we, were, we backpacked into the Point Reyes National Seashore. We're actually on a, uh, a uh, campground right on the edge of the ocean. In fact, we were watching whales go by and things like that. And then all of a sudden my younger son pulls out the, the uh, basic starter set which actually had a, another adventure inside of it. You just had that for the rule books and, and a bag of dice. And so he'd carried that all the way into the, uh, the back country with him. And he played through that briefly because it was actually a fourth edition game or adventure that he had uh, converted for fifth, but he hadn't changed any of the hit points. And if you remember in fourth, like you start with 30 hit points and it goes mm -hmm. up from there. So they get down to like the big fight at the end and, and all the creatures there have like three times the hit points they're supposed to have and he just wiped the whole party out. It's like, but then the whales came by. So it was a good time to go actually go watch the whales. So it's like, hey, y'all died good. Let's go watch the whales. Perfect. You know, so sometimes a TPK is okay. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes. It was very timely in this case. So yeah, it worked out well. I don't but know yeah, how many people definitely... can say that whales interrupted their D&D &D games. I don't know how many people would get to say that. Yeah. Actually, it's amazing. Um, the number of people I've run into in the hobby that are kind of like my age that basically said, oh yeah, I started playing Dungeons and Dragons back with, when I was in the Boy Scouts back in the 70s or 80s and stuff like So yeah, it was, it, it was a, a gateway even back then for, for the Scouts to get into RPGs. That's cool to hear. I, I unfortunately never got to be part of the Scouts, but you know, it, I think it is important to start people playing tabletop RPGs early because I truly do think that they are great for, you know, team building. They're great for, you know, letting out your, your creative side. You know, I think there's just a lot of great benefits and, you know, and also it's a great way to not stigmatize being a nerd. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, let's face it, the nerds have won. I mean, if you think about <laughs> exactly. it, it's like Dungeons and Dragons is everywhere. Um, comic book movies are the number one thing at the box office. You know, everybody wants to be a software engineer. So yeah, I mean, it was, it, compared to the 80s, yeah, the nerds have won. Um, but yeah, there's so many things, and that's the irony. Uh, you, you hear about uh, them mention it over on uh, the Dragon Talk podcast all the time that, you know, back in the day, they're like, oh, you don't want to do Dungeons and Dragons. You'll just be uh, all alone by yourself in a dungeon or, you know, a basement somewhere, you know, and not have no friends. And now it's like turned around and it's like, wow, there's all these benefits to doing role playing games. You know, you, you learn to uh, team build, you learn to uh, do action negotiations, you learn to, you know, solve puzzles. Um, you know, you get to, you have to work with other people and, and you get all these friends out of it. And so it's like, yeah, it's totally turned around to completely the other way. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for, you know, because the more people we get into the hobby, the more stuff we're going to get and the higher quality stuff we're going to get. And we're seeing that now they're pump Wizards of the Coast in particular is pumping out a bunch of books and we're also Isn't getting video crazy? games yeah. and getting movies and, you know, and yeah, then we're we just going, going, going right now. It's, it's amazing. It's like a book a month almost. Yeah. And, and what's really awesome is they're not keeping it all in house, right? Because here you are, right? And yeah. just, you know, the, the fact that they're reaching out to people and getting to contribute to the awesome hobby is just fan freaking tastic. Yeah, that was the really crazy thing about the whole project is um, we were all in our own little silos. We were our own little world. Um, 
we were, you know, like in my case, I was talking with Chris Perkins. There was a couple of other folks there at, at Wizards that uh, were the direct contact for some of the other authors. We had no idea who was on this project at all. And, and actually at the time, you know, silly me never even thought to ask. It's like, oh, I got this thing and now I'm doing this thing and I got to get this thing done. And then, and, you know, never even thought that, oh, hey, you know, there's probably, I don't know what a dozen or two dozen other people working on this. And then we finally got the email in announcing when Candlekeep was going to come out. And you're just looking down the list of emails and you're like, oh, they're on this one? They're on this one? They're on this one? I mean, and, and just, I mean, you just take a look at the, that list of names. Um, you know, you've got, uh, you know, Amy and Kiana and, and, uh, and uh, all the other folks from, from Hollywood. And, you know, you've got Daniel who does Asians represent. Um, there's just all these, you know, big names that, that are on there. And you're like, eh, and then I'm looking at the going, and, and little old me, the guy with the <laughs> moderately popular actual play podcasts, like, how'd I get on this? And after all, <laughs> so it was, it was really gratifying at that point in time. It's like, look at all these great names that were on here. And, and somehow I ended up on that list of names as well. I mean, regardless of your humble beginnings, you, your hard work obviously paid off and you got to appear on a star-studded list, you know, and forever and all the time, your name will be in the, in that book, right? Like that's, that's really cool. Yeah. And it really was just kind of a labor of love. You know, it's like, I would, I would turn around and do it uh, every single month from now on if I could, because it's just, uh, it was just so much fun to do. It's like, you're just, you know, pounding out this, this adventure, just like I do for the podcast. And, and just like I do for, you know, putting together a one shot for, for, you know, my son's friends or something like that. And uh, this time it just ended up in a book that uh, Wizards produced. Yeah. So speaking of that, you, uh, you say that you want to do that and Wizards, please, you know, get <laughs> more, do more, but do you envision yourself now uh, hopping into this line of work of pumping out either little adventures or one shots or, you know, yeah, everything yeah. else? I'm, I'm working on, uh, well, the first thing I'm working on is I didn't realize how um, popular this was going to be, you know, whether uh, people would even want to see anything related to it at all. So right now I'm working on a kind of a really quick prequel adventure that would get you to uh, Candlekeep. And then also the follow-up, because obviously this one leaves you with quite the cliffhanger. Um, and actually that was kind of um, also by purpose, uh, just from, from my past as well, because uh, one of the things that I, I mentioned in one of the um, interviews that Wizards did is like a lot of my inspirations have come from like the old serial uh, sci-fi books and, and adventure books from, you know, back in the, the golden age of sci-fi. And, and a lot of those would end up with these open-ended endings. It's like, you know, this huge adventure would happen and we landed on the, uh, the planet and now the whole planet is open to exploration. You, you know, you decide what comes up next. Uh, so I kind of ended the, the, uh, the adventure that way, and especially being first level. It's like, you know, you can go anywhere from here, but you know, people have been asking for, you know, kind of a follow-up adventure and uh, then who knows? I mean, I'm, there's not a lot out on, uh, on the uh, protagonist there. So might end up with a few more adventures down the line that you actually end up meeting the, uh, the landlord, if, especially with the people that have taken over the mansion, that could get quite interesting. It's like, you're living in my house now? <laughs> I think the number one question in our huge community, we have we have discords for all of the modules is, uh, does Fistandi appear anywhere else in this book? <laughs> we get that she all does, the time. Yeah, she does not. And once again, that's because of the siloing. You know, yeah. None of us knew what the other people were doing. Uh, which actually for the authors, once the book came out, we're just like going through looking all these fantastic ideas that the other authors had and going, wow, I wish I thought of that. I wish I thought of that. I wish I thought of that. It's like, you know, and uh, yeah, so none of them are connected in any way, shape or form aside of the fact that they all uh, start there in Candlekeep somehow. Yeah, and, and that's been an interesting challenge to overcome uh, because some people do run these as one shots and they work out perfectly well, just fun little mm -hmm drop in and then open-endedness. Some people run these as little mini campaigns where they uh, stretch any one of these adventures into three, four, five sessions. And some people are taking every single one of them and running it as a full-blown campaign. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, there, there's a ton of things you can do that. Right off the bat, we get introduced to this mansion and hey, maybe that mansion will prove to be our uh, little abode in the future. And maybe that imp will come back to bite us if we didn't kill the thing. Or, you know, there, there's a lot of fun things you can do with that. And, you know, I, I love that unique challenge, but at the same time, I know that a lot of people also love having a concrete start, middle and finish. So 
you putting out content that would allow for there to be that closure, I think would be absolutely fantastic. Yep. And, and working on that when the, when the scouts aren't, uh, aren't uh, filling all my time, which that was the only one good thing about this thing being in the middle of the pandemic. It's like <laughs> everything else in all of our lives was completely put on hold and you're just staying at home. It's like, well, what's better to do than write an adventure at that point? So that, that, that worked out very well for me. I'm sure 2020 was a great year for, uh, for people to actually get to writing. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure. It was bad for everything else, but it was good for that. Yeah. It, it, it definitely had its downsides or two. <laughs> One yeah. or two. But um, so, yeah. So you are, you're, you're plugging away at the podcast. You're plugging away at now trying to make some adventures. And of course, you're doing a great service with all of the, the scouts. Uh, are you doing anything else? Are you working hard on anything else? Oh, I'm just playing working hard at this point in time. Um, I work in the wine industry as a day job because uh, obviously writing isn't uh, isn't wall to wall money as as uh, <laughs> I think we all know. Um, so I work in the wine industry here in in Sonoma County, uh, which is is an, another uh, you know deep love of mine. Um, and then uh, in addition, I just do way too many other things. I'm I'm a hockey goalie, so uh, that 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 also was on hiatus during the pandemic. So I had time to go write an adventure, but. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the ice rink opened up again, so we're all back on the ice, and uh, then just uh, just too many too many little things here and there. That's the problem. There's just too many little things, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, once once the kids are all off at of college, it'll be a little easier. But uh, that's that's just beginning to happen now. Okay. And uh, I mean, you, but it also sounds like you get to at least, you know, rope your kids into the D&D &D life. And that's totally awesome, too. I, for, on my own fault, uh, or on my own part, my parents won't play D&D &D with me. And so, yeah. which no, is my, my parents didn't do that much either. I, they would sit in if I, if I made them when I was younger. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that was actually, that was one thing about D&D &D when, when uh, we first started playing it back in 1979. It's like, we had no idea it was new. You know, it's like, you know, you know how dumb kids are. It's like, this has always been here. You know, this is, you know, and there's always been adventure games, right? We had no idea that we were in on the very forefront of a whole new type of gaming that was going to take the world by storm. You know, we just, and it, that was kind of neat. It's like, you'd go down to the, to the hobby shop and there'd be new modules written by Gary Gygax right there. It's like, you know, now looking back at it, you're like, wow, that was a uh, pretty spectacular times. And I had no idea what, uh, what a, a fun thing I had just, you know, organically been a part of. Yeah. I, I couldn't imagine going down to the, the local store and seeing, you know, B1, B2, B3, mm -hmm. like right there on the shelves. Like that's, it, it's such a foreign concept to me nowadays. Everyone, yeah. one, everyone buys everything on Amazon now, but <laughs> two, yeah. you know, uh, you know, just the, the actual people that started the whole thing and right there and there's nothing else like it. That, that's, it's totally awesome to, to hear stories like that. Yeah, it was really neat going from, you'd go into the hobby store and they'd have like model rockets, something, and, and then there'd be like a couple of war game things over here to 10 years later, like half of the wall is now Dungeons and Dragons books and miniatures and things like that. And the model rockets are way over there now. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, uh, it was a uh, you know, whole, whole gravimetric shift and we had no idea we were in on the very part, beginning of part of it. Um, although that actually made it kind of like a lot like uh, the Candlekeep Mysteries book itself. It's like, we didn't have anything like a campaign back in the day. I mean, you, you, there wasn't, you know, you didn't buy a book that would take you from one to 20. You know, it's like we would go and, you know, everybody started out in the caves of chaos there and in, 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 uh, in the keep on the borderlands. Absolutely. Because uh, that came with the, the basic set. And, and so we, we, we played that through about 1600 million times. <laughs> and, uh, but then it's like you would get done with that and you would just like go down to the hobby store. It's like, well, what do they have for levels three to five? Oh, look at this one. This one looks pretty good. Let's go buy that. And, and then we'd run that and then we'd get to the end of that. It's like, well, what do they have for six to 10? And it's like, oh, look here, this is a fun one. Oh, look, here's another one. And there's a guy with a, with a, uh, a you know, laser gun shooting a giant uh, you know, plant creature. That looks good. Let's do that one. Oh, good old, uh, good old. Uh, I, I can't remember which one, uh, but the name is uh, Expedition of Barrier Peaks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. I don't. Even, was it was it an X series? I can't even remember now. I think it was. Uh, it was one of the S series actually. You know, S -series. For, for the and then and then the, you know then next it's like hey hey I got this one here that's got giants in it. That sounds good. Let's do that. And then it, of course that leads into Drow, and then that leads <laughs> you to the Abyss. Um, and you know so 
you, you, you never had a campaign, you just would go like module to module. So that, that actually dovetails very nicely with what goes on at Candlekeep. Yeah, I, 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 like the, I like the smattering of things that we're getting from Wizard of the Coast right now. I like these big old epic adventures. And then I also like these quaint, uh, you know, adventures that aren't dealing with world ending events, right? Yeah, we, definitely. We, we, we can do with, you know, just diving into some book or going to some desert or, you know, going to, to some cave or something. I, I think that's a perfectly fine adventure. Yeah, you're you're more like a gig worker at that time. It's like, <laughs> hey, what do you got next? We got something out in the desert. Let's go do that. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's totally awesome that you got to contribute to that. And you know, your your ventures right there in the beginning. You're you're number one right there. Yeah. yeah, I hadn't thought about that at the time, but yeah, it's like, <laughs> in, in retrospect, yeah, if I do the first level of adventure, it's going to be the first one in the book, but it, w it wasn't until people started doing reviews of the book and they're paging through and, oh, and here's the first review or first adventure by uh, Michael Polking Horm. And <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, oh, wow. And then everybody did that review. It's like, oh, yeah, my, mine's the first one in the book. It's going to be up first every time. I didn't even think about that at the time. I mean, either want to be first or last, right? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> That's usually how it goes. Although there's an awful lot of really neat stuff right in the middle, too. Oh, so that yes, was, there yeah. is. There yeah, is. and that was an interesting thing um, to, uh, you know, parse as we were going through. It's like, you know, as you were mentioning, when you do a first level adventure, you got to make sure that it's not overly difficult and you and, and I did have to tone things down for for mine um, like the mimic is is intentionally uh, weak uh, just for that very reason um, but also uh, you know there was a couple of ones where I was like okay when I designed the the book golem which uh, then became the swarm of books uh, then uh, it's like you know, well you know if we put it in at this level that's going to wipe the party so let's keep toning <laughs> it down until we get something that can actually do that and then on the other side you have the the authors that did the like the 15 16 17th level ones where now you've got like you know epic level monsters with lair actions and things like that and there's a whole you know now we have to make it harder to to uh, <laughs> go and, and uh, meet with those expectations and um then you know the ones in the middle are, are sometimes the, the the toughest of the ones to do too because you you got to make it tough enough but not too tough. So yeah, it it was a, a very interesting challenge for me because I ran all of the adventures in a single week and I was just me reading, 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 running, 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 and it was an absolute clown fiesta of a time. But you know it was, <laughs> it, it was a great time, and you know I the fact that I got the spearhead it with this was a very fun one. I. Um, Something I did for all when I ran all of these in the week was I didn't allow any long rest ever, no okay. long rest. So, you know that that was a particular challenge for the very first adventure and several other adventures throughout. Because, hey, if you get injured, you got that one hit die. <laughs> Good luck. Yep. Yeah, that was that was a fun thing for actually for a lot of people that that went through the adventure. It's like they're like, I forgot how very little you can do as a first level <laughs> character, um, and you know I had to be kind of cognizant of that the whole time. Uh, we turned in our final draft and it just went into the black hole that uh, you know is the <laughs> publishing uh, wing and we never got to see anything until it actually came out the end as a published product so uh, that was it was I remember looking through the initial uh, uh, reviews on it as they're paging through and once again I said you know because mine was the first adventure of the book I got to see mine a lot you know kind of kind of getting really close to the screen but <laughs> oh good hey Kuman and Coriander made it into the book and oh the, you know there's that thing that I did that made it in the book so it, it was neat to see what actually made it in and and then actually what got changed a little bit um, so that was kind of fun like uh, for instance in in my adventure the password at the end uh, to get out of the mansion is not the password that I submitted and yeah it was um it was it was it was like flumps it was flumps that's what it was yeah yeah i try to put flumps in everything uh that uh, that i do and uh in fact i had a uh, one of the other groups that i that i played with we had a, a, an ongoing sci-fi campaign and there was like a flump floating around in all the different planets they went to and uh if if the campaign had gone on long enough they would have met the over flump who was actually in in charge <laughs> of all the flumps and is actually running everything behind the scenes um, that, but yeah, amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. Hey, I can, and you know, so I have no idea what happened in the playtest portion of this. I can only assume that people struggled with that one, and it was. I'm difficult. willing to bet they changed it from flumps to liberty because new people to D and D do not know what a flump is. Versus, yeah. if they're from the U.S., they should hopefully know what liberty is. <laughs> but <laughs> who knows? 
Yeah. So yeah, and then there was little things here and there that uh, that got changed, and and that could have been play test, or could have just been the editing process where it's like, okay, we got to take half a dozen words out to fit it on this page. What are we going to do here? Um, actually, what one of the interesting things was uh, the uh, swarm of books. I actually put in as a book golem, mm -hmm. um, and actually had basically golem stats. And so when I you know open it up and there's a swarm of books, I'm like. This is so much cooler than what I had. <laughs> so I'm not sure where, where in the play test that, that got changed um, or whether it was just something where the, you know, during the editing process they were looking through and, and said, uh, yeah, you can't really make a golem out of books, but we could do like a swarm of books. And it really ended up with basically the same stats and basically the same attacks. Um, oh, and that was the other thing. My, my book club uh, attack pun got in there. So um, <laughs> I, I, I try to lay at least one good pun in every adventure I do. And uh, so I, I was pleased as, as long as the book club got in there and as long as Kuman and Coriander got in there, I was, they could change everything else up. So. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. No, I want to run a book golem. <laughs> I, I, I want to run that now, but um, yeah, that, it, it, it's totally awesome to, to hear that, uh, that what you put down was uh, not, you know, it was tidy up, you know, it was, it was cleaned up as, as good as it needed to be for the book. And that's truly what matters. And yeah. I, and that is the strength of the uh, editing process too, because uh, you know that's one of the great things about a published adventure versus a homebrew adventure. Um, the the great thing about the homebrew adventure is you can really tailor it for your group, and um, it can be really intimate, and you can change it on the fly. Uh, with uh, uh, but with a published adventure, you know it's been through all these steps. You know they play tested the uh, combats and things like that. So so you don't end up with things like um, in Relic of the Past early on, the uh, group ended up in this ruined cemetery, and they had you know arms reaching up out of the ground, grabbing at them, making everything difficult terrain. And the crypts opened up, and and these uh, skeletal horsemen came out and started charging them. But then I also had I put cotton balls on the uh, the battle map because they also had these vapors floating around, which in my mind was going to be this really cool impediment to combat because they were going to move randomly around the board. And if they ran into you, then you had to do a constitution save or you breathed in the evil vapors of the dead and, and, and collapsed unconscious. Except they moved randomly around the board and only one time did they actually <laughs> run into one of the players during the entire combat. So it was just like, a total non-issue really and, <laughs> and so if i'd had a chance to play test that instead of writing it up on my own I, you know we would have play tested through and went yeah the vapors really didn't do anything we should probably drop those and you know so yeah that's that's uh that's the downside of the homebrew stuff you come up with these great ideas that just like nope that didn't work out at all i mean i want to run that now too but it definitely sounds like there's a lot of variance <laughs> yeah. so maybe uh maybe less variance is probably the way to go with that one i don't know but um you know, I, I think I think having a you know fun thing like that, but for sure, you know, th th these products getting play tested now more and more, not only from the unearthed arcana that they're putting out, but also all the play testing that they're doing therein is is great because they are going to have cleaner products. They're going to have you know products that aren't just fresh off the the you know the printer, and that's what we want. We want products that are you know toned and well done and. I, I'm I'm certainly excited for the future to come because Wizards of the Coast has said that they are pumping out more and more playtesters because they want to get that awesome feedback. Yeah, and our group has done uh, playtesting for some of the extra life offerings, and yeah, it's 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 fun to do, and uh, you know we we do end up sending valuable info back to them. It's like ones where it's like you know this didn't work out quite as well as I think you thought it would work out, or you know this 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 uh, horrified all my players. Good job, because <laughs> that's what you're shooting for. Or you know um, you know you this uh, this tricky encounter that uh, that uh, happens early on. My players cottoned on to it right away and weren't fooled in the least. And you know so yeah that that uh, playtest feedback is really valuable. And it's fun to do. So if you ever get a chance to do it, I definitely say go do it. Heck yeah. yeah. All righty. So, you know, whenever it comes to talking about all these things, I always want to talk about what do you want to see next? So what do you want to see next from Wizards of the Coast? <sighs> That's a toughie because, like I said, I'm a Greyhawk kid. So I'd love to see uh, more of the older... Uh, 
different campaign settings and things like that. I'd love to see Dragonlance back in again. Sure. Um, I'd love to see Spelljammer come back in again. But at the same time, I also know that that's how TSR got themselves in trouble back in the day, where they had <laughs> so many different branches and products that they couldn't support them all. And you know, unless unless that's bringing in, you know, viable income to the company, it's just a draw a drain on the company. So, I. As much as I would like to see those, I would also like uh, Wizards to please keep everything uh, moving in a uh, sensible direction too. So uh, we'll see. But at the other hand, the the uh, folks over at Wizards really seem to have done a great job of integrating them, everything that's come out with, you know, the current uh, system and the current uh, product line so that you don't have these offshoots that are just doing something crazy that have to be supported by themselves. So, so if any wizards could do it, probably this current iteration of wizards of the coast can probably make that happen. So kind of hoping they'll be doing that. Um, wouldn't mind them seeing more, uh, you know, maybe not a lot more, but you know, maybe once, once a year or so, another one of these books of just all these, you know, various one shots you can do is go and toss into your campaign here or there everywhere. Cause even if you don't run the campaigns, you know, all of those magic items, all of those monsters, all of those extra spells that come out in these things um, are all things you can go in and toss into your campaign as well, even if you're running just a homebrew campaign. So would not mind that. That's all resources we can use. Absolutely. You know, I, I'm excited to use Candle Keep, not just as, you know, little one shots, but maybe even just taking little scenes and, you know, monsters and items and whatever else, you know, and just placing them wherever, right? Yeah, because yeah, you can totally borrow from it. It's like, hey, this fight that happens in, in this particular adventure is really awesome. I'm going to put that into my adventure. You know, the, the <laughs> next next Sunday when everyone comes over to uh, to play, uh, you know, they're going to run into this particular thing. Absolutely. So, what do you want to see next from the community? The community is just amazing. Um, you, you know, and any anyone who like first gets into the the online community, and, and you know. Obviously, there's always those bad actors, especially when we're dealing with the internet, but the community is just kind of amazing. And it's just kind of fun to see, especially, you know, um, you know, coming at it now from someone who's actually written something that everyone's, uh, you know, can, you know, f giving feedback on. It's just kind of fun to see everybody get in there. It's like, and this is how I changed it and how I did it in my campaign and how I edit. It's like, this is amazing. Like, um, you know, one of the original uh, playthroughs that someone did, they actually translated everything to Eberron because that's where their campaign was in. And it's like, this is great. I never thought about, you know, what it would be like if it was if set in Eberron, even though, you know, in the beginning they do list, you know, you could put this in this such a library in Eberron and this library in Greyhawk and this library and, and uh, things like that and, and have seen people translate it to uh, their other campaign worlds and things like that. So um, anyways, you know, so community, just keep up the good work. You're doing a great job. Yeah, I'm I'm excited and proud to be a part of them. You know, with all the the Reddit's and the Discords, they are popping mm -hmm. off. We've got thousands upon thousands of people in all those various Reddit's and Discords mm -hmm. and wherever else. And it's great to see these people come together and share their stories. Say, hey, here's what I did. Oh, here's what happened. Da -da -da. This and that. And like, that's really cool to just riff off of other people and talk to other people and see what's up. Yep, yep. And, and then, of course, obviously, it's also good for getting the, the negative feedback, too. It's like the, the one thing that we struggled the most with in my adventure was the beginning, because um, I, I had had it you know, originally, like I said, the, my original beginning was you get sucked into one of the books. But then once again, that would have required an entirely new spell that wasn't in canon and things like that. Um, so we, we kind of worked it around to uh, where we ended up with the, the, uh, the current iteration of the beginning. Um, and you know, one of those things where if I could step back and do it again, I think I would, you know, take one more hard look and say, you know, I think it works better if they just did something to get sucked in there and then, you know, maybe creatively sit down and figure out how we can do that without having to create a new non-canon spell. Um, but then on the other hand, that's one of the great things you can do when you take the book and then translate it into your own adventure where you can just say, hey, I'm going to take this adventure, but you're all going to be sucked into the book. Why? Why? Because I'm the dungeon master and I just said you got sucked into the book. <laughs> I, 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 I may have master. said that almost verbatim. I may yeah. have. Because <laughs> <laughs> obviously when you write it as a book that can be given to everybody that has to basically fit in all the worlds, you have to come up with the beginning that basically sticks to the canon spells and would basically work for everybody, even if it doesn't work precisely for your group. 
because then you can go and change it if it doesn't work precisely for your group and you can and you can say okay now this is what's actually going to happen i know what it says here on the page and you can't see that i'm only one reading it but this is how you know i'm going to change it so that it works that way so and that's been one of the great things about the community it's like you know they immediately kind of tripped over that it's like a bunch of people made it work a bunch of people didn't make it work and came up with you know i think even better ideas than, than the one i had which is it's always fantastic as you open the door and the door appears a gust of wind hits you from behind you get pushed in <laughs> you yep. know so you could do something as simple as that right yeah. well, you just open it up and just zoop right into the book yeah exactly and lastly what do you want to see from yourself like I said, I'm looking forward to uh, getting a little more free time um, <laughs> and to I can actually sit down and, and start writing like this because this was an most amazing um, opportunity, most amazing experience. Um, just, you know, when, when you're, we all like to sit down and, and just, you know, write away whenever we can. But it's another thing when you're like, oh, I've got a deadline. I've got to meet this. I got to sit down and write. And you're like, and that just makes the creative juices go, you know, so um more more things where i can sit down and, and just let the creative juices flow because this was an awful lot of fun to do heck yeah that, that's awesome to hear because we don't want you know works of you know we don't want products that are just labor right we want labors mm -hmm. of love we want yep. people that are passionate about what they're putting down because th those are truly the best you know adventures in my opinion yeah, you can always tell when someone was basically just uh, doing it because they had a word count to hit and, and a <laughs> deadline to meet versus those that were like really, truly inspired. And, and, that, and I think we've seen the Wizards has really gotten a bunch of good people together to do that. I mean, even, you know, Candlekeep is the most obvious one because they have just this whole list of authors in the back. But I mean, even look at like Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, and they basically got this whole pantheon of, of writers for that one that all work together as a team. And and uh, yeah, I think they're doing that more and more. So you get all these other voices that come in and, and the, the more voices that you have, the more interesting things that come out of it. And, and obviously Candlekeep has been the best example because there was just, you know, you go through adventures and you're like, I would never have thought of that. I would never have thought of that. I, you know, and, you know, a different author comes in with a different perspective and a different uh, life experience and comes up with a totally different adventure you would never thought of. And you're like, I wish I thought of that. This is great. <laughs> Curse you for being more creative than yeah. me. <laughs> Yeah, I got to say, I, I never thought of doing a magical day spa. That yeah. one, that one never occurred to me. I, I might have thought about doing a uh, martial arts academy, but I didn't, and I'm <laughs> really happy that Daniel did. So yeah, there's a, just some really fun things. Oh, absolutely. They, they, you know, running through that, like every single one stands out on its own. Every single one hits up different areas of the world. Every single one hits upon themes that the others don't, and it, that's just so great to see that variety because variety is the spice of life and death in our D, &D yeah. games and isn't that all we care about <laughs> the... exactly yeah exactly all right yeah that was this was absolutely fantastic to talk to you and get that little creative process there and seeing where you're getting up to and all that fun jazz is there anything you want to say to the world do you have anything you want to sell do you have anything that you want to show well, um... off yeah, if, if you liked what uh, I did with the, the uh, torture that I inflicted on you in Candlekeep Mysteries, uh, obviously, like you said, we have 208 episodes of me torturing my party uh, there on, on Relic of the Past podcast. And, and you, if you listen to that, you'll notice a lot of DNA that uh, translates over to Candlekeep. There, there was de definitely uh, a lot of that flair. I mean, uh, actually, right now, um, these episodes won't be out for a couple more weeks, but uh, the uh, party is, is unfortunately having to explore the ancient home of, of the gnome tinkers. And uh, right now they're taking about a D10 of, of pun damage at, at every th turn. Uh, the, the very first office that they go in when they come in is the home of gnome land security. And it just goes downhill from there. So, <laughs> and they haven't even got to the worst part of it. Just wait till they get to that. So. Oh, oh gnome, <laughs> oh gnome. Exactly. Uh, all right, well, I, I certainly uh, I can't wait to be beaten over the head with some gnome puns. That sounds entertaining. All righty. Uh, that's going to do good. it. Those will be out in the next couple of weeks here. Heck yeah. Uh, that's going to do it for us. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you, everyone. This was absolutely awesome to get to talk to. So uh, that's going to do it for us. And I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.